it's always sad for the guy that comes after the legend. Well, when you replace a Vince Lombardi, I mean, you're held up to a certain standard. Yeah, a lot of times these guys replace legends, and then you realize that you might be better off without the legend. As long as there's been iconic NFL players and coaches, there have been the poor souls who have had to follow in their footsteps, for better or for worse. When you follow a legend, a guy that won a Super Bowl, people are always going to compare you to Bill Parcells, to Vince Lombardi. What the hell's going on out here? Certainly not everybody can, can be better than his predecessor. But the pressure's immense because the fans love these guys. You're just a, some schlub if you don't deliver. And I'm not saying win. He's got to win championships. In compiling our list, we consider the exploits of the legend as well as his replacement success in filling his shoes. It's how well the guy fills them. You know, I think that's what you have to judge it by. That's when we think in terms of, boy, look what he had to follow and look how well he did. We begin our countdown with a big star, a big city, and the boy from Alabama miscast as a savior in the Big Apple. In Todd we trust. Yeah, right. Richard Todd's almost a, uh, a punchline, I think, for anyone who's a Jets fan. There has never been a quarterback in the history of football that found the open linebacker better than Richard Todd. In 1977, Richard Todd had the misfortune of replacing Joe Namath, the hero of an entire generation, and the undisputed sports icon of New York. The game is over. The New York Jets are the world champion. This is the guy that won arguably the most important game in the history of the NFL. And you're the guy that has to replace that guy? He has finally crept out of the large shadow cast by Joe Namath and is establishing himself as a first-rate quarterback in the near future. When they were looking to replace Joe Namath, I think the Jets went overboard trying to find the clone of Joe Namath. The same college, same everything. He replaced Joe Namath at Bama, which was, whatever, impossible. And then he replaces him in the Jets, and then good luck. They tried to convince themselves that they had another name, but what they had was Richard Todd. Richard Todd was the answer to the question, what happened if you took Joe Namath and took away all of his personality? Yeah, not only is that big shoes to fill on the football field, but in the media, in town, at nightclubs, and with women, Richard Todd stood no chance. I'm just uh, trying to get along, you know, just, just trying to get by. Look at that shot. Joe Namath was the man. Richard Todd, nice player, was Richard Todd. Richard Todd was moody. Richard Todd was surly. Richard Todd, Todd was a hard guy to get along with. And the most damning thing, Richard Todd was not a very good quarterback. By the 1980s, our number 10 replacement had developed into a solid quarterback, leading the Jets to back-to-back -back playoff appearances. 21 seconds remaining as Todd is back to pass. He's looking into the end zone. Oh, Todd was a respectable quarterback that never really got his due. Richard had a little bit of swagger to him. You know, Richard wasn't, uh, he wasn't Broadway Joe, but, uh, but he was no wallflower to say the least. And he had some very productive years at the end of the 1970s and the beginning of the 1980s. In 1982, Todd had a chance to create his own legacy when the Jets advanced to the AFC title game against Miami. Eventually, Richard Todd does get them to the championship game, although, of course... He has the dreadful championship game. Intercepted again. Picked off by Dewey. Where A.J. Dewey, you know, intercepted 12 or 15 of his passes. Fourteen to nothing, we blank them, shut them out. If they would have had a better quarterback than him. Intercepted by Dewey. They had enough on that team to be to, to get to a Super Bowl. If not for the quarterback. Good enough to be pretty decent, but in New York in that era, you gotta be you gotta win the whole thing. 
Even to this day, the Jets are still looking for Broadway. Coming up, which coach found Super Bowl glory on the way to number nine on our list? Without even knowing who's in front, I think nine is too low. When you're succeeding anybody who's successful, it's tough enough. When you're succeeding somebody who is successful and a personality, it's doubly tough. Replacing a big chief can be fraught with difficulty. Jack Pardee made no one forget about George Allen in Washington, but he did have the best 70s comb over in all of pro sports. A team that, uh, that cares about each other and plays hard is hard to beat. Pardee wasn't pretty, but few can equal the sheer horror of the Ray Handley debacle in New York. Nobody succeeds Bill Parcells. There's no better act. It's the best act in football. What the f are you doing staying 10 yards in the Replacing Bill Parcells proved just as difficult as replacing Vince Lombardi. Comes to mind as Phil Bankston, who followed Lombardi. Gentlemen, let me introduce to you now the new head coach of the Green Bay Packers, Mr. Phil Bankston. Really none of Lombardi's assistants ever succeeded as head coaches, and there were a lot of them. Unlike Bankston, our number nine replacement took his franchise to new heights. The number nine toughest act to follow. Tom Flores replaces John Madden. Wow, that's a whoa. number nine. I don't need to see the list. I mean, I think without even knowing who's in front, I think nine is too low. Yeah, I think Flores should be higher. If one of our criteria is how well did he fill the shoes, Flores filled them extremely well. To the point where he wound up winning more Super Bowls than the legend that preceded him. Not only does John Madden sport the highest winning percentage of any coach in NFL history, he's also an unforgettable character. On the sideline, he was a maniac. Hey! Hey, the Never clung one on them! Wow. Well, one guy fills up a room, and the other guy, you don't even know he's in the room. We know what has to be done, and we know how to do it. When you're succeeding anybody who's successful is tough enough. When you're succeeding somebody who is successful and a personality, it's doubly tough. If you talk to a lot of people today and ask them who was the coach of the Raiders on all of those Super Bowl teams, there are some people to this day that will argue with you that it was, oh, that was mad. No, it wasn't. It was a guy named Tom Flores. At the time, it was like, who is this guy? But Tom Flores, he might be a Hall of Fame coach. Tom Flores, you're talking about qualifications? Give me a break. Our number nine replacement went from Raiders quarterback to assistant coach under Madden before taking over the top job in 1979. He's a prime example of what you want. Tom Flores did it his way, his own style. There was no other John Madden. He was able to implement the things that he picked up as an assistant coach under Madden. Like how to maintain order in the halfway house of the NFL. You talk about miscreants and athletes. You, you had yeah, Ted Hendricks, uh, uh, questionably the greatest playing nut in the world. To make that work, man, that's your head coach. I'm proud of you. Who are you? New Orleans. Despite his success, why is a two-time Super Bowl championship head coach ranked so low on our list? <laughs> I think we all know the answer to that question. Uh, there's a man named Al Davis. Does anybody know the NFL Network? Al Davis, we've heard of him, right? He owns the team. And, uh, yeah, I think Al's domineering personality and domineering ownership style makes it difficult for any Raider coach to ever flourish on their own. Perhaps it's also the stature of the man he replaced who only coached for 10 seasons. See, I consider Don Shula a legend. I don't consider John Madden a legend. Don Shula replacing Weeb Eubank? Now that's replacing a legend. Did Tom Flores fail? No. He coached pretty well, he had a good team. Anytime you walk in and replace someone that's been successful and has done it this way, and you go out there and do it your way and still win, I think it's you should be on that list. The number eight of his act to follow. Neil Anderson replaces Walter Payton. More than anyone else, Bears football was personified by Walter Payton. 
Through 13 seasons, Peyton vaulted to icon status in the hearts of the Chicago faithful with his physical style and never surrender attitude. If you have to follow somebody like Walter Peyton, a Hall of Famer, you can only hope to make your own tracks in the sand. Peyton walked away from pro football after the 1987 season. When Walter retired, we were certain here in Chicago that there'd be nothing that would be equal. When Neil Anderson was asked to replace Walter Peyton, he did a remarkable job. Neil Anderson quickly showed he was up to the challenge. Looks to cut it back now, bounces to his right. Right. I tell you, that guy's faster than I thought he was when Daryl Green can't catch him. Remember, they, he was the number one pick, and they thought they wouldn't miss a step. When I came in, I was playing behind the best of all time, so I couldn't just jump in to some first round and do it start immediately. I had to wait my turn. We really hadn't heard all that much about him. This kid from Florida coming in uh, was quicker. Comparisons between Peyton and our number eight replacement were inevitable. Anderson sought not to replicate a legacy, but rather to create a new one. I think what he tried to do was be himself, and if you look at his personality, he was a great deal different than, than Walter. All I can do is go out and be Neil Anderson and uh, do the things that I can do. We never compared him to Walter. We, we weren't like that. We knew that he was not going to fill the shoes all the way. Cuts to the middle at the 30, 25-20. He might go. Neil Anderson, touchdown, Chicago. Anderson surpassed 1,000 yards rushing in his first three seasons as a starter. You had to play against Neil Anderson. He was the most underrated superstar ever. Four-time Pro Bowler. That's not a one-time deal. Four-time Pro Bowler for an NFL running back. That's incredible. The physical price of being a featured back caught up with Anderson and possibly cost him a higher ranking on our list. Injuries cut short his career, so we really never got a full appreciation of how far and how good he might have been. You couldn't make the comparison to Walter anymore because Walter Payton never got hurt. But despite rushing for over 6,000 yards and 51 touchdowns, not everyone is impressed. I don't remember anything defining about Neil Anderson, to be honest with you. Just a good, solid NFL player who... You know, certainly wasn't, was never one of the great backs in the game. If you can handle that pressure of following a great player and producing the way Neil Anderson did after following uh, Walter Payton, I think that's terrific. Coming up, which offensive star faced an uphill battle from day one? He was handed a job that just cannot be done. You would have thought he was terrible the way he was treated by the fans and the media. It's time to score double... Plenty of quarterbacks have had to replace legendary passers. Not all have had enough success to crack our list. Denver's Brian Greasy made the Pro Bowl in 2000. Scampers to the goal line, and that is a different touchdown. But family and franchise pressure got the best of him. I think Brian Greasy had a hard enough problem trying to follow his father's footsteps, much less John Elway's footsteps. After Ken Stabler was shipped to Houston, Jim Plunkett won two Super Bowls with the Raiders. Oh, oh. So why can't he make our list? Dan Pastorini was Stabler's original replacement before breaking his leg. So in other words, this list doesn't, doesn't, doesn't have anything to do with winning and, and uh, replacing guys who were winners and coming in and maintaining that stand has nothing to do with that. While Plunkett collected Lombardi trophies, our next man up never got his storied franchise to the big dance. The number seven toughest act to follow. Danny White replaces Ryder Stallings. Throughout the 1970s, there was no greater Western legend than Captain Comeback himself, Roger Staubach. Roger was my all-time hero. He was every young kid's hero in the state of Texas. When they build the Mount Rushmore of sports figures in this town, he will be head and shoulders above the rest of them. But even monumental heroes eventually retire. I appreciate my teammates through the years because I'm one that's been successful in this system. I remember even though Roger retired, I went, we got Danny White. We're going to be fine. For more than a decade, Starbuck was an extension of the coach in the huddle. Now came a man more accustomed to carrying a clipboard than carrying a team. If there was anybody I would like to copy myself after, it would probably be Roger, but I'm not going to try to do that. If it turns out that way, fine. But I'm going to do the things that Danny White does best and do them the way that I do them the best. 
He was handed a job that just cannot be done. Danny White could have won three Super Bowls in his first three seasons, and he was never going to be as popular as Roger Staubach. Our number seven replacement kept the Cowboys winning. In 1980, his first year as starter, he staged an epic playoff comeback against Atlanta. Right, dropping back. And throws to Drew Pearson, and he is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Danny's first three years, they went to the NFC Championship game every year. Lost all three years. Lost in the shadow of the catch was White's own last-minute rally. Danny White was a play away from making his own legacy. Dallas still had a chance in that game, and they hurried back upfield. Eric Wright's horse collar saved the touchdown. White's fumble one play later doomed Dallas for good. If Eric Wright does not grab uh, Pearson's jersey at midfield, maybe we look at White a little differently. Danny isn't a guy that you watched and went, <gasps> Danny was a solid technical quarterback. He ran the plays sent in, he ran them well. But would Danny ever make the rabbit out of a hat play like Staubach? No, generally no. And for a guy that goes to the championship game three in a row, you would have thought he was terrible the way he was treated by the fans of the media in Dallas. Roger's a legend. Danny will never be like that. The quality in the clutch. I just don't think he has it. I think Roger Staubach's a great quarterback and I miss him. Our number seven replacement actually threw for more touchdowns in his career than the man he replaced. Danny White had a 62 and 30 record as a starting quarterback. How many quarterbacks in history have won more than twice as many games as they lost? In other places, there might have been other acts that were tougher to follow, but around here, I can't think of a, a tougher one. But his postseason failures kept him from replacing others higher on our list. Danny White could have won one Super Bowl. I think he would be right up there with Roger Staubach in history, but he didn't, and those three championship game losses kind of defined him. I don't think he was at his best on the days that he had to be at his best, and that's what Staubach was. Number six up is that to follow. Sonny Jurgensen replaces Norm Ben Rockland. That was a tough act to follow. I mean, Sonny had some big, big shoes because they had won a championship. The fabulous Dutchman, Norm Van Brocklin, earned the league's most valuable player award for his role in the Eagles' flight to victory. The Eagles won the NFL championship in 1960, and even though Norm Van Brocklin spent only three seasons with the team, he became a Philadelphia legend. The Eagles won their first world championship since 1949. Van Brocklin really owned the city. In 1960, after winning the championship, Van Brocklin epitomized Philadelphia. He was a tough, gruff, great passer. 1960 was Philadelphia's last chance to see Van Brocklin. He retired at age 34. The daring Dutchman faked beautifully to Dean and lost the pass to Billy Barn. Whoever was going to step in, that was going to be about as tough an act to follow as you could ever imagine. Jurgensen has the unenviable task of filling the great Norm Van Brocklin shoe. After four years spent mostly on the bench, Jurgensen became the starter in 1961. The Eagles didn't miss a beat when they went from Van Brocklin to Sonny Jurgensen. Jurgensen was phenomenal in 1961. He threw 32 touchdown passes in a 14-game regular season, which was a team record that still stands. Sonny Jurgensen was a 1990s type quarterback in the 1960s. He waits for the pattern to unfold, then calmly takes the ball to Bobby Walston. He is, in so many ways, what everybody sort of sees as the quintessential quarterback. He always had this kind of smile on his face. He would throw passes behind his back. And he throws one behind him. And that spectacular play came five yards and a first down. Sonny just liked to party a little bit. And I don't think the Eagles like that. He played harder off the field than he did on, and I think they got scared of him in Philadelphia. By 1964, Jurgensen was a redskin, thanks to a move Philly fans can only describe as the Eagles being the Eagles. He traded him for Norm Sneed. Sonny was a short time in Philadelphia, but it was a great time in Philadelphia. With Jurgensen doing the pitching, it looks easy. 
Van Brocklin and Jurgensen each spent only three years as an Eagles starter. So does Jurgensen have any business at all appearing on our list? Sonny Jurgensen belongs on the list because he replaced the quarterback that just won the championship. People don't remember Sonny as, a, as an Eagle. They remember him as a Redskin. So I can't put him as high as some of these other guys. I like him at number five really because he came from behind a future Hall of Famer and picked up right where he left off. Anytime you have to replace a legend, it's always tough and there's no more legendary quarterback in Eagles history than, than Norm Van Brocklin. Coming up, which of these men found shockingly quick success after replacing a legend? Handled it better than anybody who could have followed. What he did might never be done again in sports. Look across that field! In the NFL, there are some acts nobody wants to follow. Before we go back to spreading our stuff, here's a recap of our list so far. Number 10, Richard Todd sweeps up Broadway. There has never been a quarterback that found the open linebacker better than Richard Todd. Number 9, Tom Flores quietly succeeds Madden. We know what has to be done, and we know how to do it. Number 8, Neil Anderson outsweeps sweetness. Can't feel those shoes. You can only hope to make your own tracks in the sand. Number seven, Danny White can't dodge Rogers' legacy. I think Rogers Starbucks a great quarterback, and I miss him. Number six, Sonny Jurgensen has to replace the toast of Philly. That was going to be about as tough an act to follow as you could ever imagine. And now, number five, tough as act to follow. Johnson replaces Tom Landry. Replacing a legend like Tom Landry is is almost impossible, except for Jimmy Johnson. Tom Landry became the first coach of the Dallas Cowboys in 1960 and held the job for 29 seasons. Along the way, he cast quite a shadow in Big D, stringing together an NFL record 20 consecutive winning seasons. Landry was more than a head football coach here. Landry was a giant in this city. He was just what everyone uh, thought a pro football coach should be. Landry's Cowboys claimed their first NFL title with a win in Super Bowl VI. What do you think, Coach? Six years later, Dallas won a second Super Bowl. But not even Tom Landry was irreplaceable. Landry suffered three consecutive losing seasons from 1986 to 1988, and the writing was on the wall. As bad as it's been. Landry's last year, he was 3-13, and 13, so there were already probably a bunch of people disgruntled with Landry. I respect Tom Landry, but uh, I think the game passed him by just a little bit. This is going to be heresy to say, but it was well past time. Bob Bright, the owner, sells it to a guy who just got off the turnip truck from Arkansas, Jerry Jones. Tom Landry was just dumped on the street by Jerry Jones, just fired immediately. You never know how many fouls you have, boy, when you try to clean them out. Jerry Jones was like, yeehaw, I'm coming in and changing everything. You're going to love this new guy. You replace the man in the hat with the man with the quaff, you know, with Jimmy Johnson. There could have been better circumstances as far as me coming into this position. It just felt wrong to say Jimmy Johnson, Cowboys head coach. Here comes Jimmy. Get those hands up, look at me! About as polar opposite a human being from Tom Landry as you could possibly get. Tom Landry was stoic and quiet and composed and never showed emotion. I'm off a cop regardless of what happens. Jimmy was just the opposite of that because he always showed emotion. Johnson's first season in Dallas was a disaster and only made fans long for the glory years even more. When the Cowboys went 1-15 that next year, I don't think there's anyone around here who thought they would win Super Bowls under Jimmy Johnson. And I think Jimmy felt that pressure, that, that first year especially. There's no question in my mind that fedora cut a huge shadow, really blocked the sun for Jimmy Johnson. But not for long. Jimmy restored Cowboy pride. While it took Tom Landry 18 seasons to win two Super Bowls, it took Johnson just five. Jimmy Johnson's taken his team from the absolute worst to the absolute best in four years. 
Landry was still the honored figure. But the talk in town was, man, how about those Cowboys? It was maybe the greatest organizational turnaround in the history of sports. So why is Jimmy Johnson only number five on our list? For starters, his attempt to replace Don Shula in Miami never produced more than one playoff win in any of his four seasons. Hey, look at the you want to now. And in Dallas, he was hair one day and gone the next. Too low. I don't know who's in front of him, but what he did in five years might never be done again in sports. Yes, Tom Landry was legendary. He won us Super Bowls, but as far as him being a tough act to follow when he left, I really don't think he was. It's the Cowboys, and it's a new owner, and it's Tom Landry. This is going to be way higher on the list. He handled it better than anybody who could have followed uh, Tom Landry. Anybody. Well, anytime you compare anybody with Jim Brown, you're comparing talent against the best talent that's ever played the game. The greatest running back of all time. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. The pro game in the pop age had a number of superstars. But only one Superman, and he was Jim Brown. He just has an aura about him. He has such a presence, and, you know, it can be almost intimidating to be with him because, you know, he's just almost bigger than life. You would think that there was no way anybody other than Jim Brown could play running back for the Browns after Jim Brown was gone. No shot. No shot. How could you replace Jim Brown? But Leroy Kelly was remarkable. For two years, the only ball carrying Kelly did for Cleveland was returning kicks. Then, Jim Brown retired. Leroy took his place and became a star. So Jim Brown walks away to work on a dirty dozen, and Leroy Kelly comes in there, and you talk about a no-win situation. Look at his numbers after replacing Jim Brown. After taking over as Cleveland's featured back in 1966, Kelly led the NFL in rushing twice and retired with over 12,000 career all-purpose yards. But Leroy Kelly was this very, very versatile back. He was a great runner, a punt returner, kick returner. He wasn't the same power runner, but he could put his foot in the ground and cut. You finally, you, you, you're zooming in on him, and zoom, he's cutting back. He had great balance, and the sloppier the conditions were, the better a player he was. Not only was he successful, but he was a popular player. Brown was not a popular player because of his personality. So here comes Leroy Kelly, and all of a sudden the fans embraced him. The rest of the National Football League liked him. The rest of the fans liked him. They don't have to play against Jim Brown anymore. Kelly becomes a Hall of Fame player. I don't know how much better he could follow and act. So why is Kelly only number four on our list? Well, there are a few issues to consider. Leroy Kelly really didn't replace Jim Brown. Jim Brown was a fullback. Leroy Kelly was half a running back. Automatically he was good once he started because he still had the Cleveland offensive line that Jim Brown had. He was a power runner. He learned under Brown, so he just jumped on the scene. If you wanted to create a scenario to arguably replace the greatest player who ever played, and it was Leroy Kelly, I don't think he could have done a better job than he did. So if you're replacing Jim Brown, well then it should be number one, right? No, no, I think he's, I think that's good. I think that's good. I think a guy that followed Jim Brown and now sits beside him in Canton, Ohio, that's filling the shoes pretty well. Up next, which legendary coach set the bar extraordinarily high for his replacement? That might be as big a pair of shoes as football's ever seen. Who can question his success? He's been an incredible head coach. Replacing a Super Bowl winning coach with another has not happened often. George Seifert squeezed two more titles out of the 49ers after replacing Bill Walsh. I'll tell you what, I'm happy for you. But Seifert didn't make our list. We're going to play it physical. That's the story of 2008 still. Neither did Mike Tomlin, who won a Lombardi trophy in just his second season with the Steelers and got them back to the Super Bowl two seasons later. It's been remarkable and Mike's done it his own way. I'd say Mike is certainly deserving of the top ten list. No sale, Baldy. Tomlin didn't crack our list. 
but the man he replaced did. The number three toughest act to follow. Bill Power replaces Chuck Noll. I think Bill probably was the perfect guy to replace Chuck Noll. I mean, that might be as big a pair of shoes as football's ever seen. Chuck Knoll was the head coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers for 23 seasons and won an unprecedented four Super Bowls. The champions of the National Football League for the fourth time. At the time, Chuck Knoll was the undisputed gold standard, not just for the Steelers, but for football. The thing you have to remember about Chuck Knoll and how great a coach he was is the Steelers were the worst franchise in football before he came along. They had never won a playoff game. When you have a coach who takes a franchise that really had not done anything for 40 years and then all of a sudden make that franchise the best franchise on the planet, you probably have set the bar higher than it should be set. It's my pleasure to introduce Coach Bill Power. At first, it was Bill who? I mean, this guy didn't really have a track record. They liked his look, the big jut jaw, the way he was visibly emotional on the sidelines. Heck, visibly emotional pretty much all the time. Oh, the, let's go, get your head out of your ass. Rush the quarterback. You understand? Yeah. Rush the quarterback. Come on, Hagen! Get on him! If you grew up in the Berg like I did, that's every second guy you meet. Steelers fans may have had a soft spot for certain chins, but what they really wanted out of Cower was wins. There wasn't enough time for Steelers fans to say, hey, we miss Chuck Noll because the Steelers got good right away. The number three man on our list led Pittsburgh to playoff appearances in his first six seasons. Every single year, Bill Cower had that team prepared, ready to go into the playoffs. Who can question his success? I mean, an incredible head coach. Well, there was one nagging issue. Bill Cower lost a lot of huge playoff games. San Diego did it! They pulled off the upset of the year! Can't win the big one. That starts to hang around your neck. The Patriots have laid a weapon on the Pittsburgh Steelers. The criticism was fair. He lost four AFC Championship games at home. Not to mention Super Bowl 30 against Dallas. Sometimes it was, sometimes it was. When it came down to big games, he was crap and his teams were crap. And the record shows that. Of course, all that changed in 05. That was the year Cower Steelers became the first team ever to win a Super Bowl after winning three playoff games on the road. The Pittsburgh Steelers did it the hard way. I think it changed his whole legacy. <laughs> all his playoff failings disappeared. He got a free pass whether he deserved one or not. I don't know when it's going to hit me, but it's like surreal right now. Yes, Coach, number three on our list is certainly prestigious, but is it deserved? I think first would be a better spot. Bill Cowher replaced, at the time, the gold standard for coaching in the NFL. I don't think it was the toughest because it took Bill Cowher 15 years to win a Super Bowl. If you compare it to Jimmy Johnson replacing Tom Landry, it's similar, but Jimmy did it instantly. No one's done what Chuck Noll did. Four Super Bowls in six years. You're going to replace that guy? Yeah. I mean, it could be higher. Certainly could not be any lower. Coming up, it wasn't exactly the smoothest of transitions from one quarterback to the next. He didn't want to be his mentor. That's not what he was paid for. I'm sure he had like a little pillow stem. Like getting all the anger out. NFL history is littered with franchises that have struggled to replace legendary quarterbacks. Hall of Famer Len Dawson led the Chiefs to a win in Super Bowl IV. The greatest quarterback in pro football. Jim Kelly took Buffalo to four straight Super Bowls in the 90s. And it is hot. He's got it And Dan Marino set numerous records during his Hall of Fame career with the Dolphins. Now he's done it all. In each case, no heirs were apparent and none have been found. It's a very difficult thing to do because the standard has been established. But one team replaced its big cheese with a real whiz. The number two toughest act to follow. Aaron Rodgers replaced.
Blazers Red War. I don't know that anyone would have expected Aaron Rodgers uh, to do as well as he has in taking over for Brett Favre. When Brett Favre started piling up stats in Green Bay in 1992, Aaron Rodgers was all of eight years old. There's a man, it's wide open, touchdown, and the Packers win it. For 13 seasons. We're talking about a living legend of the game. I mean, Brett Favre has broken every record that you can break. Brett Favre is... Brett Favre. That's why right, Brett Favre is Brett Favre. Yep. If Brett Favre is playing, people stayed and watched just because of the things that he could do. Uh, the way he could improvise, the way he made a game exciting. What a play by Brett Favre. He shoveled the ball forward as he was going down. In 2005, Green Bay drafted a quarterback in the first round. The Green Bay Packers select Aaron Rodgers, quarterback, California. Number two on our list was number two on the depth chart for three years. I realized early on what kind of relationship it was going to be and that I needed to just soak up as much as I could. He didn't want to be his mentor. That's not what he was paid for. Come on, dude. Why do you have to be such a pain in the butt about the whole thing? I believe Brett Favre one day would say, hey, Aaron. Put her in the old body. And the next day, Aaron Rodgers would walk up. Hey, Brett. And Brett Favre would walk right by him. I'm sure he had like a little like pillow with like Favre's name on it. him. Getting all the anger out. Obviously, I think the transition could have been made a little bit easier, but that's just how it went. I think a lot of people just thought because he wasn't on the field that he wasn't any good, that he wasn't good enough to displace Favre. Finally, after all these years, Rodgers becomes the quarterback. Okay, Aaron, we're ready. He's great. What a throw by Aaron Rodgers. He's been an amazing replacement for Favre in a lot of ways. Uh, has toppled Favre. Still candy from a baby right there, baby. His first three years, he's, he's better than Brett Favre was his first three years. Rodgers passed for over 12,000 yards and 87 touchdowns in those three seasons. And in 2010, he led the Packers to a Super Bowl title. What a crowning jewel of a season and a performance he had. Hey, who am I leading today? Who's going to be the big dog with me? Scans the secondary, pulls it over the middle. If he was still in the shadow of Brett Favre, he certainly isn't anymore. It's number two on your list. He deserves to be number two on the list. A big number, sure, but he was around forever. Aaron Rodgers, for Favre, is number one. It should be number one. Rodgers steps into a town where football is the only thing on everybody's radar. Go Rodgers! Really one of the great follow-up acts in the history of the league. And guess what? There's more to come. He, he's not done. Coming up, somebody had to try to follow our number one act. What can you do to ultimately fill those shoes? It's like a, a, a guitar player trying to replace Jimi Hendrix. These too loose. I'm already wobbling around in these. We've got guys trying to fill some big shoes however and whenever they can. Before we continue, let's take a look at the list so far. Shoes feel good. Yeah, they, they fit well. Number 10. The Jets introduce the second coming of Broadway Joe. In Todd We Trust. Yeah, right. Number 9. John Madden's replacement keeps winning. Minus the bombast. Right here. Who are it? New Orleans. This is wrong, but the Bears' running game isn't going anywhere. When Neil Anderson was asked to replace Walter Payton, he did a remarkable job. Number seven. It's safe to say Big D does not stand for Danny. He was handed a job that just cannot be done. Number six. The Eagles win a title and change quarterbacks. The Eagles didn't miss a beat when they went from Van Brocklin to Sonny Jurgensen. Number five. The stoicism exits, but the domination returns. Number four, Leroy Kelly does the impossible, replacing Jim Brown. Kelly becomes a Hall of Fame player. I don't know how much better you can follow an act. Number three, Bill Cowher has no trouble motivating his teams. Rush the quarterback. You understand? Rush the quarterback. Number two, who would have thought anyone would say this about Aaron Rodgers? He's been an amazing...
amazing replacement for Favre in a lot of ways has toppled Favre. And now, the number one toughest act to follow. Steve Young replaces Joe Montana. The problem with that whole scenario for anybody other than Joe Montana was you can't replace Joe Montana. It's just not possible. What can you do to absolutely, to ultimately fill those shoes? It's like a, a, a guitar player trying to replace Jimi Hendrix. Montana, gets up, throws. Nobody did it with the ease and the calmness of one Joe Montana. Steve Young was traded to San Francisco in 1987 which turned Joe Cool into Joe Frigid. From the moment he walks in the door, you know, he's arch enemy number one for Joe Montana. I think there's uh, no secret, there was no love lost between those two guys. When we get over here and we start, and I do it too, we start freaking on each other. Steve Young wants what Joe Montana already has, and Joe didn't like that. I think there was some genuine, old-school, kind of uh, Dirty Harry animosity there. I got stepped on like I've never gotten stepped on before. I was crying. It took him four years on the sideline before Steve Young finally got his chance to play for the 49ers. I mean, at some point, we got to play football. And boy, he didn't disappoint at all. An injury sent Montana to the sidelines. Then a trade sent him to Kansas City, allowing Young a chance to flourish. Rose, he gets it to Brett Jones into the end zone. Touchdown, 49ers! Once that opening came, hey, school was out because Steve Young was ready for that position. A promotion to number one on the 49ers depth chart only intensified the challenges for number one on our list. Down to the 15, then he lost the ball. Joe Montana would be running in the first place. Montana is still the best, and he always will be. It would be obvious if he didn't win, what are the fans going to say? Whose fault was it? The quarterback's fault. He was winning passing championships. Young to throw, quick slant and Jerry Rice. You know, he's winning MVP awards, all that stuff. But he couldn't win the championship. It's tough to constantly uh, have that going on, but that's kind of um, kind of par for the course. In 1994, Young had his best season individually. But before he could get to the top of our list, he had to get the 49ers to the top of the NFL heat. They're thinking, is he going to get that monkey off his back? He's going to get that monkey off his back. Young led the 49ers to Super Bowl 29 and threw six touchdown passes, breaking the previous record of five, which was held by Joe Montana. Pass left flat, Ricky Waters, touchdown 49ers! When he finally got over that hump and, and beat the Chargers and threw six touchdown passes, that's when he became accepted by 49er fans. It's just catharsis. It's everything just releasing. No one could ever, ever take it away from us, ever! And it might have been take that Joe Montana. When it was all said and done, Steve Young was like, yeah, take that Montana lovers. I just want a Super Bowl. So does Steve Young replacing Joe Montana deserve the top spot on our list? I mean, it's just a question. Absolute no-brainer that Steve Young had the toughest act to follow. That's number one. That's number one. For a million different reasons, that's number one. He took a situation that was nearly impossible to handle, and then he became a great legend himself. It's the best story 